Good morning. Thank you so much for including me in such a terrific event with such terrific organizations. Um, it's an honor to be here today. And I hope I'm able to give all of you a sense of how the innocence movement collectively has broken through power to not only free hundreds of innocent people, but also to begin the process of achieving real systemic change. I'm the executive director of the Mid-Atlantic Innocence Project, which works to prevent and correct the conviction of innocent people in DC, Maryland, and Virginia, using DNA and other evidence of innocence. We've freed 21 innocent people and helped pass 11 laws that would help prevent or make it easier to correct wrongful convictions. It's one of the highest success rates in the nation, and we're doing it with a fraction of the resources we need, um, and a fraction of the resources of some of our peer organizations. But we're part of a larger innocence network, with more than 60, which has more than 60 separate organizations that all work to get innocent people out of prison. And together, we're freeing innocent people and changing laws all over the country that are making the criminal justice system a little bit more just. Since 1989, there have been 347 DNA exonerations and almost 1,800 non-DNA exonerations from both network projects and other terrific lawyers all over the country. And I want to tell you the story of the innocence movement today, why it started, how it started, what it has accomplished, and what we still have left to accomplish. And since our strength lies in the stories of the wrongfully convicted themselves, that's how I want to tell you the story today. And I want to do that by taking you back to 1986, an important year in the innocence movement. It was the first time DNA was used in court, in a criminal case in the UK. A year later, DNA first appeared in a US courtroom. DNA was revolutionary because it allowed us to take physical evidence from a crime scene, something other than fingerprints, and use it to, to compare to a specific person, either identifying them or excluding them. It's taught us volumes about the types of evidence we relied on before 1986, things we didn't know about then. And it's in that context that the case I want to talk to you about today occurred. On February 23rd, 1986, a woman was alone in the laundry room of her South Richmond apartment building a little before 10 p.m. A man walked in, carrying a knife and wearing a stocking mask that covered his face. He told her to be quiet, got behind her, and shoved her toward the door. He began undressing her. When they got outside, she started fighting back. She screamed and was able to lift the stocking mask to see a little bit more of his face. He eventually got spooked and ran away. The victim did her best to describe the attacker. She'd only seen the bottom half of his face, but she described a white man who was about six feet tall, 175 pounds, wore a red and white plaid shirt, had light colored shoulder length hair, a beard, and high cheekbones. Because this was an attempted rape and not a rape, they couldn't even use the limited forensic science they had in 1986. All they had was the victim, who did a composite sketch. The composite was circulated to other police officers, and one of them thought it looked like a man named Mike McAllister. Mike was 29, a little over six feet tall, had light-colored shoulder-length hair, a beard, and high cheekbones. He had no history of violence, but did have a history of alcohol abuse and a few alcohol-related incidents of indecent exposure. His apartment was a few miles from the crime scene. When police got to Mike's house, he was wearing a red, white, and blue plaid shirt. Police wanted to take a photo of him and told him he should change his shirt. But Mike said no. He didn't have anything to hide, so why would he change it? Police included that photo as one of nine they showed the victim. Mike was the only one wearing a plaid shirt and the only one whose features closely matched the description of the perpetrator. So Mike was arrested. Mike's trial lasted four and a half hours and the only evidence linking him to the crime was the victim's testimony. Mike was convicted 
of abduction and attempted rape. That could have been the end of the story. But a little bit before trial, the lead detective heard about a man named Norman Bruce Durr. Durr was a white man, about six feet tall, with light-colored hair and a beard. He tended to wear plaid shirts. And he was a serial rapist. He'd been followed by police officers in other counties, but he avoided detection because he usually wore a stocking mask during his crimes. Mike didn't know this until 2015, but many of his 1985 and 1986 attacks were in laundry rooms in South Richmond, just a couple of miles from the crime that Mike was charged with. When the detective saw Durst's photo, he thought it looked a lot like the description of the attacker in Mike's case. And I'm gonna tell you, when I saw those two photos side by side for the first time, I couldn't tell them apart. But after the victim saw Durst's photo, she was still sure that Mike was her attacker, and the trial went forward. And even after Mike was convicted, the prosecutor started having doubts about Mike's guilt. He talked to the judge, and they gave Mike a polygraph, but it was inconclusive. He was sentenced to 50 years in prison. He lost his appeal, because his trial was considered fair. And there was nothing anyone could do. At that time, people who weren't in the criminal defense world weren't all that aware of the problem of wrongful convictions. A few academics had written articles about wrongful convictions in capital cases, but those just evolved into debates about whether those particular people were innocent, not conversations about what had caused those wrongful convictions and what could be done to prevent them. But that started to change in 1989 when Gary Dotson became the first man in the U.S. to be exonerated by DNA testing. From 1989 to 1992, 10 people were exonerated based on DNA evidence proving their innocence. And this was a game changer. These exonerations didn't hinge on the reliability of witnesses. They were scientific proof that innocent people got convicted. Barry Sheck and Peter Neufeld knew we convicted too many innocent people in this country. They also knew that as long as the fight was about the credibility of witnesses, we couldn't really have that conversation. So in 1992, they founded the Innocence Project in New York, litigating cases all over the country in which DNA testing could prove innocence. Shortly after that, Mike McAllister got a new lawyer. The lawyer learned that Norman Durr's attacks looked a lot like the attack Mike was convicted of. He attacked women alone, using a knife. He was easily spooked. And he even said some of the exact same things. But more importantly, the lead detective and prosecutor in the case had come to believe that they had arrested and convicted the wrong man. And in some places, that would have allowed Mike to be released from prison. But in Virginia, the trial court is not allowed to do anything in a case more than 21 days after a person is convicted. And there was no other way in Virginia to bring new evidence of innocence before a court. The rule was absolute, no exceptions. Mike had a parole date coming, and the detective and prosecutor wrote letters supporting his parole. They even appeared before the parole board on his behalf. But it didn't matter. His parole was denied. And as that was happening, the innocence movement was getting started. In 2000, the first Innocence Network conference, with 10 mostly new innocence organizations, including my own, was held in Chicago. Between 1993 and 2001, 91 more people were exonerated based on DNA testing. And that was true even though our system isn't set up to deal with the problem of innocent people in prison. And that's because our system prizes finality. It's hard to raise claims of newly discovered evidence of innocence. It's hard to prove constitutional violations. And it's hard to get around all of the procedural barriers designed to keep people from trying to do those things. And so it became clear very early that the innocence movement needed to address not just the disturbing number of innocent people in prison, but also the system's inability to correct that problem after the fact and the things that cause wrongful convictions in the first place. 
And during this time, some people in power were beginning to notice that there was a problem. They started passing laws allowing for post-conviction DNA testing, raised questions about the death penalty, and started talking about the things that caused wrongful convictions. But the prevailing norm was still to be tough on crime. That period of time saw Democrats take the crime issue away from Republicans by issuing their own tough on crime policies, from the 1994 Crime Bill to the 1996 Anti-Terrorism and Effective Death Penalty Reform Act, which made it nearly impossible to use habeas corpus to free innocent prisoners. Despite all of those setbacks, 2002 was a blockbuster year for the innocence movement. 25 people were exonerated by DNA testing, still the highest number of DNA exonerations in any one year to date. DNA exonerations became part of the public consciousness, and people were starting to understand that the system made mistakes. It also was a big year for Mike McAllister. People had forgotten about him, but his mom wrote to Frank Green, a reporter at the Richmond Times-Dispatch, who began writing about his case. A new lawyer also signed on to help Mike, and he filed a pardon petition with then Virginia Governor Mark Warner. Virginia was no stranger to the problem of wrongful convictions and had seen its share of eyewitness error, but in 2003, Mike's petition was denied. The governor's staff said it would be one thing if Mike had DNA evidence, but he didn't. From 2003 to 2013, 187 people were exonerated by DNA testing. That decade also saw a real change in the conversation about the criminal justice system, with even more states passing laws that allowed DNA testing, and some even starting to pass laws that would help improve eyewitness ID procedures, prevent false confessions, and regulate state crime labs. Even Virginia passed a law, in part because of Mike's case, that allowed people with newly discovered evidence of innocence to get back in court in very limited circumstances. Mike eventually made parole, but he had to register as a sex offender and had never gotten treatment for alcohol abuse. So he did a lousy job, complying, began drinking again, and was sent back to prison. Norman Bruce Durr was convicted of two crimes during that decade. In 2006 and 2012, he was convicted of two 1984 rapes, one in Virginia and one in Charles County, Maryland, based on DNA cold hits. I learned about the Charles County case because of a man named Jerry Jenkins. Jerry had been convicted of a similar Charles County rape based on the testimony of a victim who said he looked like the perpetrator. And Jerry had always been adamant that he was innocent. Now he believed Durr was the perpetrator. We began representing Jerry, found the DNA, DNA evidence, and did the testing that proved that Jerry was right. He was innocent and Durr was guilty. Jerry was exonerated in 2013. A few weeks later, I got a call from that reporter, Frank Green, who had never forgotten about Mike. He asked me what we were going to do to get Mike out, and we began to represent him. Mike's innocence only became more clear the more we dug into the case and the more documents we received. But once again, Virginia's criminal justice system fell short. We had no remedy for Mike. We couldn't prove how much police and prosecutors knew about Durr because it had been so long and memories had faded. So we couldn't argue that evidence had been withheld. We couldn't prove that Mike's trial lawyer was ineffective. We thought he knew something about Durr but we didn't know what or when. And we also couldn't prove that the evidence was newly discovered because it's possible that everyone knew about it but just didn't know how to use it. So we were stuck. To make matters worse, in early 2015, the Virginia Attorney General's office decided that it was going to try to civilly commit Mike as a sexually violent predator, sending him to prison for the rest of his life for a crime that no one involved in the arrest or prosecution believed he had committed. Defendants almost never win these cases. Guilt or innocence is irrelevant. Undoing it is next to impossible, and normal remedies for criminal convictions don't apply. So that meant our only remedy was an absolute pardon from the governor, which we had to file three weeks before Mike's civil commitment hearing. 
didn't look good. Pardon investigations usually take months. We had weeks. We still had no DNA. Governor McAuliffe was a Clinton Democrat who hadn't been interested in criminal justice reform. Mike was a convicted sex offender with substance abuse problems, a history of indecent exposure, and a history of poor adjustment during his brief stint on parole. He also had already been denied a pardon by another Democratic governor, and the rules say you can't file two petitions. So we were in a bind. Um, but it quickly became clear that things had changed between 2003 and 2015. We filed our petition jointly with the elected prosecutor in Richmond, whom we had convinced of Mike's innocence. We had several legislators on our side from both parties. We also got to work hand in hand with the investigator for the parole board, and Durr eventually confessed to her that he'd committed the crime. So on May 13th, 2005, just a few days before Mike's civil commitment hearing, the governor granted the pardon. It's good. His first call was from Governor McAuliffe, who apologized to him on behalf of Virginia and welcomed him home. Thanks to the governor, Mike got transitional funds and legislative compensation for his time in prison. And today he's with his family for the first time in decades. And I focused on this case today because I think it makes clear why the innocence movement was so necessary, how far the, movements has, how far the movement has come, but also how far it has to go. There's no question in my mind that without the innocence movement's ability to free hundreds of innocent people based on DNA, no one would have understood that an eyewitness could have made a mistake in Mike's case. We wouldn't have been working jointly with the prosecutor if it hadn't been for that work. And we wouldn't have been in a universe where it was politically palatable, and I think in this case even politically necessary, for the governor to do the right thing. But what's also clear is that we need to keep fighting to make the system itself more just. There's been progress. In 1992, zero states allowed for post-conviction DNA testing or best practices for eyewitness ID procedures. Today, all 50 allow DNA testing, and 15 require best practices in eyewitness ID cases. 10 states compensated the wrongfully convicted back then, and 30 do today. And we're having real conversations about other problems in the system, like race and overcriminalization, that were made possible because people are now aware that the system is not perfect. But the work's not done. It's not clear to me that the outcome of Mike's trial would have been different today, because we don't require better ID procedures in enough places. Mike was in prison for far too long because of a system that prized finality over justice and didn't allow for cases like his to be corrected. That was just as true in 1986 as it is in 2016. Mike was released in spite of the system and because of an extraordinary confluence of public officials and a reporter who came together to do the right thing. But with different public officials, I fear that Mike would probably still be in prison. So my message today is a positive one, that the conversation about wrongful convictions has changed because the innocence movement's work freeing innocent people and advocating for systemic change has helped it get there. But it's also a call to action. I hope you'll join me in working to create a more just system that not only convicts fewer innocent people, but can correct them before people are forced to spend decades of their lives in prison. The past 24 years have shown that it's possible, and with the help of people in this room, I want to help finish that job. Thank you very much.